if there's something better than getting a new coin, it probably is getting a bunch of coins at once. I recently purchased a group lot of Greek bronze coins and I realize I haven't talked about this yet. Buying coins in lots, it can be tons of fun, it can be a nice way to kickstart a collection for little money and it is also a coin identification exercise I can share with you people. So how about we get started? The idea is simple. Some dealers have to sift through a lot of inventory, so some of them group up individual coins in lots to save time on identifying all of them, on shipping individual coins of small value. This means coins in lots might sometimes be of somewhat inferior quality, but they're a great opportunity of getting affordable coins. And if you know what to look for, as you see in this lot, you might find some very interesting pieces. Of course, you can later on sell some of the coins you don't want, which helps recoup some of the money you spent. I will sell some of these coins in the future, but I managed to find some cool gems in here. And I generally advocate for buying the very best coin you can afford, but buying coins in bulk lots can be a nice way of maybe to be introduced to a new type of niche as an exercise of identifying coins as well and as a way to give a beginner exposure to what coins look like and feel like, which helps them train their eyes against potential fakes. In the case of this lot, it's a group of Greek bronze coins. I don't have a lot of these, so it was a cool experience to identify them and to get a small side collection going. So, let's jump right into them and start identifying one by one. So the first thing I did was to separate the coins in major chronological periods, like a quick identification, so at least like for the major date ranges, before going one by one and attributing them fully. In this batch, we have a couple of early Hellenistic coins, so from the time of Alexander the Great and his first successors. Then we have a couple of Seleucid coins from the late 2nd century BC, which I particularly liked. Then we have the biggest group, a bunch of brass coins from the time of the Mithridatic Wars between Pontus and Rome. And finally, one last coin from the 1st century AD when the Romans were finally taking the rest of the Greek world. A coin struck in Greek style, but under Roman administration. And we start with the Hellenistic coins. This is a coin I will eventually sell as I have a better example, but still, this is a very interesting type for any beginner. That is a bronze unit of Alexander the Great. These were struck in the many cities captured by Alexander and also during the time of his successors. They have a similar design to the silver pieces on the obverse, featuring the bust of Heracles wearing the skin of the Nemean lion. Sadly, this one has a bit of wear, so not many details and the lion are left, but it has this gorgeous, thick, dark green patina. The time of minting of these pieces is hard to pinpoint, but it can be attributed to at least the, uh, 336 BC to around the 300s BC, broadly. On the reverse, keeping up with the theme of Heracles, we have the weapons used by Hercules. The bow, with its quiver, where he kept his arrows, and the club he used to stun the Nemean lion. Between both weapons, we have the name of Alexander in Greek. Alexandro. We then move on to the second piece, and by looking at the obverse we can already see some similarities to the first coin. But with ancient coins the devil's on the details. Remember the previous coin had a lion headdress. Here, instead we have an elephant headdress. Whoever put the coin in this lot might have thought this was yet another Alexander coin, but in fact, this elephant head indicates this is a Ptolemaic coin, so struck under the authority of the Ptolemies of Egypt. In this case, either Ptolemy I or II. The Ptolemies are famous for their huge bronze coins with the face of Zeus, but this example is from this brief coinage before the reform that came up with these massive coins still made in the standard instituted by Alexander. Yes, this is not a pristine coin, but one of the coolest things about coin lots is that you might get coins that are numismatically and historically very interesting and unique, and somewhat rare. Heading to the reverse, we have the Ptolemaic eagle, with its wings open. Sadly, the flan is a bit small, 
so we can't see the legends which would read Ptolemaio Basileus of King Ptolemy, and we have the faint remains of the control marks to the left of the eagle. Once again, the devil's on the details. It would be expected for all Ptolemaic coins to be struck in Alexandria, the great capital. But in this case, the coin can be attributed to the island of Cyprus, which was convinced by Ptolemy I to defect to the Egyptian side after Alexander's death. Another element that makes this coin quite curious, it comes from a very distant and somewhat rare mint. Leaving the Ptolemies behind, we go to the Seleucid Empire. This was the largest successor state, taking all of the easternmost conquests of Alexander. They had many, many cities that struck coins, so as a result, there are millions of these small bronze pieces out there. It's another really affordable kind of Greek coin to collect. The imperial cult was very strong with the Seleucids. They really propagandized their king as a divine being, resulting in some pretty dramatic-looking coins with gods, lots of legends advertising the king's godhoods, etc. Here we have two examples from the late 2nd century BC, so a time when the Seleucids were already in decadence. The mint for these coins is almost always Antioch, as it was the last major city left in their territory. And we start with this one from Alexander Zabinas, or Alexander II. On the obverse, obverse, we can see his bust, and notice the sun rays coming out of his head. It reminds me of the Roman Antoninianos with the radiate crown. But in this case, it was a message, a connection of the Seleucid king with Apollo, the patron god of the Seleucids. Looking at the reverse, we have Athena, holding a small Nike and her spear. There are quite a few legends in, in this little coin as well, so we will have to rotate it and see what's written on it. And as we rotate it, we can make sense of what's written here. Basileus Alexandro of King Alexander. We then go to this other coin from a later king, Antiochus VIII. Once more, we have the bust of the king with the radiant crown. It has this lovely desert patina with this, these lighter tones, which really helps make out the details on the bust and help the, the details pop out. If this patina wasn't there, I would imagine this would be a very dull looking coin. Heading to the reverse, that's very nice. We have an eagle. Once more, we have quite a few lines of text as well, so once again, we will have to rotate the coin to make sense of what's written. Okay, now we can read what's in there. Basileus Antiocho, so of King Antiochus, then Epiphanos, God Manifest. <laughs> wow, that's a very dramatic title, God Manifest. Well, this makes sense historically. The Seleucids were famous for their internal struggles and palace intrigue. So they had a lot of propaganda to try to give themselves legitimacy, any legitimacy. And the trump card of showing oneself as a direct envoy of the gods was a very common trope used. Every late Seleucid monarch has these very over-the-top titles. We then move to the biggest part of the slot. These coins are all from the 1st century BC, from the Pontic Kingdom. This kingdom was the last great antagonist against the Roman takeover of the Greek world. Under their king Mithridates VI, they waged three very bloody wars against Rome, and to fund the war efforts they imposed a monetary system in the entire region based mostly on brass coins like these ones. They're very common, as they were struck in many different cities and have a lot of different designs. Sadly, I don't have all of the design types illustrated here, but one day I might do an episode on them. So let's take a look at some of these pieces. And we start with this coin from Amisos, the main mint during Mithridates' time. The mints in these coins are very easy to identify, as they're often written in pretty big letters. On the obverse of this first piece, we have Mars, the god of war, with his crested helmet. On the reverse, the central design is dominated by a sheeted sword and the word Amisos. There are also a series of monograms around the fields, likely used to control the issue of these coins, as they were likely used to pay for troops. Therefore, the number of coins issued and the mint officials had to be tightly controlled. 
Then we go to another coin of Amisos, this time with Zeus on the obverse. This is probably the most common Pontic coin design. Zeus was a very obvious choice of design to be put on coins. After all, he was the ultimate sign of authority and kingship. On the reverse, we have the animal symbol of Zeus. So we have an eagle perched over a thunderbolt. A pretty big monogram to the left of it. And under the thunderbolt, once more, the letters Amisos, identifying the mint. And then, for my favorite design of the bunch, this piece features on the obverse the shield used by Athena, the Aegis, which means protector. Mithridates claimed he was protecting the Hellenistic world against the unjustified Roman encroachment, so nothing more fitting for a coin struck in a defensive war than to feature the shield of Athena, the goddess that protected those fighting defensive wars. This particular type is also very common and affordable, and it's a fascinating design. I really like it. This is definitely a coin I'm going to keep from this lot. On the reverse, we have Nike, the incarnation of victory, advancing to the right. In fact, she's advancing so far to the right in this coin that a third of her is off the flat, sadly. She's carrying a palm branch, symbolizing victory in battle. And we can see the letters, the first three letters of the minting city, Ami. So we can assume this coin was also from Amisos, although this type was struck on a bunch of other mints as well. We then look at this other piece, which looks exactly the same as the previous coin from Amisos, showing Zeus, as I've just shown, but in this case it is from another city. We can also see by looking at Zeus's bust that it is made in different style, meaning the dies were made by a different engraver. I particularly like this Zeus better. And it's also in better grade than the last one. On the reverse, as you would expect, we have the same design, the eagle and the thunderbolt. But under the eagle, we have another city name, a polis called Dia, as we can read from the Delta Yota Alpha letters. And finally, we get to the last piece of this group. It is not in great shape, sadly, but this coin has something unusual about it. Remember, with ancient coins, it's all about the details. Well, let's first do like a full identification. Let's look at the coin's obverse and reverse, and then we dive in what's unusual about this coin. It seems like it's a piece with a similar design to the Zeus eagle type we've seen twice now. On the obverse, we can make out the contours and the overall details of the Zeus face. And on the reverse, as expected, we have the eagle perched over the thunderbolt, with the minting city under the design. In this case, Sinopeon, or the city of Sinope. But have you people noticed something unusual about this coin? It is enormous. In fact, it's a 20 grams behemoth. Well, the previous coins are just 7 grams. So what is going on here? Well, it turns out that the Pontic Kingdom struck another, likely higher denomination coin that weighed 20 grams. But it had a different design. It had on the obverse the bust of Athena, and on the reverse the image of Perseus holding the decapitated head of the Medusa. So what we have here is a flan of one denomination, struck with the dice of another, smaller denomination. This is very unusual, and I've never seen this before. It's like if a one-cent coin was struck over a half-dollar planchet, a tiny design for a huge coin. I think I'll keep this piece mostly as a curiosity, the result of some poor mix-up at the Mint some 2,000 years ago. I wonder if the Mint worker was reprimanded for this mistake. We finally then go to the last coin of this entire lot. This is a coin struck in Greek style, but under Roman administration. These are the so-called pseudo-autonomous coins, as the cities of the Greek world were integrated into brand new Roman provinces and given, given legates or procurators to administer them and oversee their integration into the Roman state. This particular piece comes from Antioch and is dated between the years 12 and 13 AD, under the procurator, under a procurator called Silenus, Silanus. The obverse is very typical for Greek bronzes. 
The Roman administration must have thought at first it would be preferable to give the coins a Greek appearance instead of stamping the face of the emperor. So we have the bust of Zeus with his majestic beard and flowing long hair. On the reverse, we have this interesting design of a ram and a star, the star likely representing the east. These coins are theorized by some numismatists and astrologists to depict the star of Bethlehem, with the ram symbolizing the Jewish people, or the astrological sign of Aries. Around the design, we also have the legends Antiocho Epi Silano, or Antioch, under the legate Silanus. And there we have it, a nice little lot of new coins. Some I will keep, others I will be selling. Have you purchased uh, any coin lots recently? Have you found some cool coins hidden in a group lot? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this little episode. Leave a like and consider subscribing if you did. Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.